we see more claims of trade secrecy and more persuasive claims. So to me, the sort of archetypal example of this is the Stingray and Harris Corporation. Harris Corporation created the Stingray, which is basically a cell site simulator that invites cell phones to connect to it. And it sold it to law enforcement, conditioned on a promise that law enforcement wouldn't tell anybody, including criminal defendants, that they were using this novel technology that in turn, once it leaked out that this was in fact going on, generated a whole bunch of litigation. So basically what I think is happening here is that as technologies have advanced to the point where law enforcement is procuring increasingly sophisticated tech, the idea that that technology needs to be in some way protected becomes more pervasive and in a way, more persuasive. I'm Jacob Schultz, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, November 17th, 2021. Hannah block Wewa is an associate professor of law at the Texas A&M School of Law, and she's the author of a recent Lawfare post entitled Alternative Channels for Police Transparency. I sat down to talk with Hannah about her Lawfare piece and the Law Review article that inspired it. We talked about trends in police transparency and what to do about it. What are the different sources that inhibit public access to police practice? What trends in the second half of the 20th century left police transparency in the state that it is today? It's the Lawfare Podcast, November 17th, Hannah block on police transparency. Hannah, when you say police transparency in your paper and in your article for Lawfare, Talk to us about what exactly that means. Sure. So when we think about police transparency, a lot of the ways that police have been trying to become more transparent to the public are linked to concepts of accountability. So police conduct community meetings regularly. Um, They disclose information, particularly about, for example, crime to the public that they serve. But they often don't disclose a lot of information about how they actually investigate and detect crimes. And in the paper and in the article for Lawfare, I'm trying to explain why information about investigations is so interesting and important to the public. And I'm arguing that there ought to be more of that kind of disclosure because the public really wants to know, and because it's important to police legitimacy, the kinds of objectives that police are trying to work towards when they're becoming more transparent to the public, we need to know more about how they're doing their jobs. So it's not just about you know engaging with the public in public meetings or uh, disclosing information in response to open records requests, although those are important aspects of it. But I'm also trying to extend the idea of police transparency to the the methodologies of investigation themselves. Yeah. And, and so why is that such a rich place for, for the public to learn about what's going on? What's the, what's the value add in learning more and having more public disclosure about those investigative techniques? I think a couple of things. Um, the first is that, you know, investigations, investigative techniques are what lead to police citizen encounters. And obviously, over the last couple of years, uh, the circumstances of police citizen encounters, and particularly when those encounters turn violent, as they often do, are very much a topic of public concern. So one issue here is how do we get to these encounters? What gives the police the sort of tip or the basis that they need to engage in this encounter in the first place? But the other part of it, I think, is that as police are using new technologies of investigation and crime detection, these technologies themselves are in the sort of public discourse as a topic of interest. So think about, for example, facial recognition. Facial recognition is increasingly a topic that the public is engaged in. When do the police use facial recognition? How do they use it? What do they do to ensure that it's correct or accurate? And so as we see 
law enforcement adopting more of these different kinds of tools, I think there's a sort of, you know, obviously there are supporters and detractors, but I think there is a general appetite to know more about how police are using them in order to understand what the stakes are. Yeah, and, and we'll get back to some of that technological stuff in a bit, but you you talk in your paper about the the role of these transparency initiatives and, and police transparency in general as part of a broader project of democratic accountability, right? So talk to us from, from a democratic accountability perspective. Why is police transparency so important? Well, I think that like obviously we're in the midst of a national debate about how to improve policing or potentially dismantle it. And at the root of that debate, I think, is a sense that police often operate without being fully accountable to the public that they serve. Sometimes they're accountable in a sort of technocratic way, right? The police chief might serve at the pleasure of the mayor or the city council. There's some sort of chain of formal accountability. But the reality is, for many communities, there's a sense that police are not really and truly accountable to the communities that they serve. And so there's a sort of a a national debate among policymakers and advocates and scholars as well about how do we make that better, right? Can we make it better in the first place? And I think transparency is a fundamental part of these debates because without knowing what police are doing, we really can't hold them accountable. Using any sort of concept of accountability, the public can't govern what it doesn't know or understand. So I think that police transparency, while it's obviously not enough to on its own create accountability, it's sort of a necessary precondition for any accountability structure that might be imposed. So as I read your your paper and, and your piece in Lawfare, part of the main argument, at least as far as I understand it, is that there there are different trends, right, that have, have cut against transparency. And we can dive into the specifics as we go along, but give us sort of the the 10,000 foot view about what you see as the direction in which transparency has, has gone or eroded in, in the past however many years. Yeah, I mean, I think a major trend has been just the, the sense of the sort of security stakes for disclosing information by law enforcement were dramatically heightened, particularly in the wake of the September 11th attacks. I think that starting with September 11th, we see state and local law enforcement taking on a much richer role and also being more reluctant to disclose much information about what they're doing because the risks of disclosure seem higher. So that's one part of it, which I don't really discuss in the paper, is about the sense that if we tell the public what we're doing, some bad actor could exploit that knowledge for nefarious ends. The other part of it that I do talk about at length in the paper and in the article is about sort of privatization and outsourcing. So the more that we see law enforcement depending on new technologies, and it's not just sort of sexy new technologies like facial recognition or predictive policing, but also technologies like, for example, body cameras. We see more and more information being generated about the sort of ins and outs of everyday policing. But there are also important proprietary interests held by the vendors of those technologies. And so together, Law enforcement is reluctant to disclose information for security reasons. They're also obviously reluctant to disclose information that might be meaningful in a competitive sense to their vendors. The vendors don't want to disclose information that might be proprietary, and they often make very broad trade secrecy claims about the technology that they're selling to law enforcement. And so there's become a sort of ecology of secrecy around a lot of the technologies that law enforcement is using to do their jobs, which they sort of contract with private entities to obtain. So I would say those are the two major evolutions in the last several years that are causing this. The third part of it 
is doctrinal, right? So as we see law enforcement depending increasingly on either, you know, suspicionless or warrantless modes of policing, we see less disclosure to other branches of government about what they're doing. And partly that's because the warrant process requires law enforcement to appear before a judge and say, this is what we want. This is our cause to get it right. Here's our probable cause. And here's our like particular thing that we're searching for on this date, et cetera. But a lot of, or basically all suspicionless and warrantless methods of policing don't require that. And so there's really a limited kind of disclosure to other branches of government about what police are doing when they use suspicionless or warrantless methods of investigation. And a lot of the time, defendants don't know that a particular method or technology has been used. So they may not even have the opportunity to litigate these issues. So the traditional way that we've learned about investigative methodologies is through the Fourth Amendment. But if litigation is sort of falling out of the picture for the reasons I've just explained, we don't have as many opportunities to understand what's going on in this space. So there's a lot to unpack there. And I think maybe the best place to start is with the technological side of things. So you mentioned the example of body cameras, right? And and the role that body cameras might play in this overall ecosystem. Using body cameras as an example, right? So talk about the types of information that a body camera produces that's, that's sort of novel information relative to the history of policing. And then what are, just to be illustrative, what are the sort of forces in more specific terms that would constrain public access to that information or public access to knowledge of how police might use that technique? Sure. I mean, body cameras are a really interesting example because body cameras were adopted on the, at least in large part, on a promise that they would enhance police transparency and accountability because they would generate a contemporaneous and supposedly objective record of any police citizen encounter. And so the promise of the body camera was this sort of real-time record of what police were doing that would enable the public to understand and ultimately to hold police accountable when they engage in misconduct. Uh, The reality has been somewhat different. And the reason is that for police, the promise of the body camera is not not only this sort of accountability potential, but also the reality of a real-time evidentiary record. And so as soon as body cameras became a sort of prevalent technology adopted by police departments around the country we saw the adoption of rules that governed when footage would be disclosed either to a person who was engaged in a police citizen encounter or to the general public. And often what we see are that the rules will allow police to withhold information when it might be germane to an investigation. And so what we thought or what accountability advocates thought would be an accountability promoting tool has turned into at the same time an evidence gathering tool. What this means is that there's a pretty strong argument in many cases not to disclose information to the public, even though technology was adopted in the first place so that the public would understand more about how law enforcement is working. Now, adding on to this is the fact that most body cameras are obtained from only a couple of vendors. The biggest one is Axon, which used to be Taser. And Axon sort of both provides the hardware for the body cam and in many cases, the cloud storage for the footage. And through its sort of terms of service has the potential to set disclosure policy on the corporate side, as well as to set the parameters for how the technology 
is actually used in practice. So Axon has publicly said that it won't build facial recognition into its body cameras, but that's a corporate decision that it made on its own, not a sort of policy decision made by publicly accountable policymakers. And so we see all three layers here. We see the reluctance to disclose information to the public because it might jeopardize investigations. We see the sort of promise of accountability being distorted ultimately and subverted. And we see that the sort of private vendor that has sold the technology or contracted with public entities to provide the technology wields an enormous amount of power to set policy without public input. So body cameras sort of illustrate all three prongs, I would say, of this sort of argument. And how much of that last point, the the point about the, the extent to which private entities can exert influence over police transparency practices, how much of that is a new thing, right? Like, I would imagine that for for some time, right, police are reliant on on private companies to furnish them with the tools that they use, right? Is it is it the case that the just the rapid amplification and the technological sophistication is like what enables these companies to exert influence? Or is it sort of this has always been happening to some extent, but just the the fruits of transparency are so much greater here? I mean, it's hard to say, like, obviously, law enforcement has always depended on private entities for a lot of technology. Law enforcement doesn't manufacture its own weapons, for example. They've always contracted with manufacturers to provide weapons, right? They buy guns and tasers just like anybody else does. I think one aspect of this is that as law enforcement has become increasingly on the cutting edge of new technologies, we see more claims of trade secrecy and more persuasive claims. So to me, the sort of archetypal example of this is the Stingray and Harris Corporation. Harris Corporation created the Stingray, which is basically a cell site simulator that invites cell phones to connect to it. And it sold it to law enforcement, conditioned on a promise that law enforcement wouldn't tell anybody, including criminal defendants, that they were using this novel technology that, in turn, once it leaked out that this was, in fact, going on, generated a whole bunch of litigation. So basically, what I think is happening here is that as technologies have advanced to the point where law enforcement is procuring increasingly sophisticated tech, the idea that that technology needs to be in some way protected becomes more pervasive and in a way more persuasive. So there's now today a veritable like cottage industry of law enforcement technology, technology to scan a phone and see whether someone was using it when they were driving, face recognition, biometric surveillance, gate recognition, you name it. And a lot of this technology is generated, developed particularly for law enforcement. Law enforcement is, in other words, the main consumer. So these firms are sort of on the bleeding edge of innovation for law enforcement in particular. And as a result of that sort of merger of innovation and policing, we see more and more sort of power being wielded by firms to set policy through technology itself. And so the other aspect of this that you touched on in your first example is the the doctrinal side of things. So I'm curious how much of the changes that you're talking about, the sort of the way that there's been a sort of doctrinal erosion of of transparency protections. How much of that has to do with evolutions in Fourth Amendment jurisprudence and how much of it has to do with, you know, Fourth Amendment jurisprudence is in a particular place and law enforcement sees that and uses certain investigative techniques that skirt around that, right? Like how much of it is is a policing policy thing and how much of it is like a a jurisprudence issue? Well, 
I guess I would say it's both. I don't think that these are particularly new evolutions in doctrine, right? So I think starting with Terry versus Ohio, we see the emergence of a strain of doctrine that basically facilitates warrantless searches, searches based on reasonable suspicion. And when was that decided? Starting in the 1960s, we see the evolution of policing based not on a search warrant based on probable cause, but instead on a concept of reasonable suspicion. And what that means is that the police don't have to go seek judicial permission before they engage in some kind of encounter with a member of the public, but rather that if it comes up at all, the legitimacy of that encounter is tested after the fact, right? And so, you know, Bill Stuntz argues that what this means is basically that the Fourth Amendment imposes a sort of tax on the kinds of investigative methods that it covers. When you seek a warrant, it's more time intensive. It requires a higher standard of scrutiny, right? Probable cause as opposed to reasonable suspicion. It's costly, right? You have to write your affidavit. You have to swear the affirmation. You have to appear in court, right? Like it's a form of process that creates a lot of friction. And I think partly as a result of the Terry decision, we see police engaging in lots of different methodologies based not on probable cause, but on reasonable suspicion. So in addition to things like stops and frisks, we see massive scale uh, vehicle stops. We see checkpoint based kinds of searches. And so those sort of encounters based on reasonable suspicion or warrantless, suspicionless encounters become less costly compared to warrant-based searches. Now, this isn't a new development necessarily, right? This has been happening for decades, but over time, I think it has pushed police towards methods of investigation that are different than what we think of as the archetype of a search warrant based on probable cause. And this comes with costs for accountability and oversight, right? To the degree that we assume policing is going to be sort of held in check by the warrant process, the less prevalent that process is, the less that assumption seems to hold any water. So I wouldn't say that they are evading the appropriate rules, I would say that they are taking advantage of the distinction between the warrant process and warrantless investigative processes. And has that sort of been a steady trajectory since Terry in the late 60s? Or is it the type of thing where there have been clear inflection points or or clear recent changes in police practice that have exacerbated the trend that you're talking about? It's not a a march straight downhill, I would say. It's more of a, there are inflection points to the extent that at different moments in time, courts have said, you know, this is not the kind of thing that we want you to do based on reasonable suspicion. This is the kind of thing that we're going to require a warrant for instead. So the example that springs to mind is the case of Riley versus California, which is a person who's arrested. I think this is in 2014. Person who's arrested, can you search their cell phone incident to arrest without any sort of suspicion that it might hold contraband? And the court says, no, we're going to require a warrant for that. So at different points in time, the court has said, you know what, we're not going to allow these kinds of technological searches to occur based on a lesser standard. But at the same time, we also see the evolution of these new methods, these new technologies that aren't searches at all or that don't require any kind of sort of Fourth Amendment scrutiny. And new technologies are evolving to take advantage of that lack of coverage. So predictive policing is a case in point 
because it sort of doesn't implicate the Fourth Amendment, arguably doesn't implicate the Fourth Amendment to sort of sweep up all this information and mine it for inferences and then give those inferences over to police. That's sort of ripe for the taking under the Fourth Amendment. And so I I guess the answer to your question is it's a little bit of both. There, There are moments in time when the doctrine goes the other way and makes it harder for police to get what they want. But there's also this reality that technology is evolving in ways that make it easier for police to get what they want. So another part of your piece in Lawfare and and the underlying article is about transparency litigation. And you've already alluded to that a bit, but I'm curious to have you talk a bit about, in basic terms, what is transparency litigation? Like who who tends to be the, the people bringing the suits? What are they looking for, et cetera? Yeah, so when I talk about transparency litigation, I'm really talking about open records litigation under state and federal freedom of information laws. All states have a open records statute. They sort of differ in the margins on how they work, but they basically entitle members of the public to obtain records from government agencies. And the assumption is that open records, the assumption in the literature has been that open records laws primarily benefit journalists and news organizations, right? Organizations that are going to use these entitlements to public records to give information to the public, basically. But what's happened in the law enforcement space is that this is still true. Uh, Journalists and news organizations do use open records laws, but we see an increasing use of open records statutes by organizations like defender organizations, by public interest groups, by movement groups, and by individuals who are trying to understand what law enforcement is doing. So one of the things that I talk about in the paper is that this sort of it not only subverts our intuitions about who uses transparency litigation, but it also illustrates how important transparency is within the criminal law enforcement process itself. So, for example, we see a number of different groups in Chicago and New York using what I call grassroots open record strategies to help individuals try to obtain information about whether they are listed in gang databases. This is really important to individuals because if you are, if you appear in a gang database and you are in an encounter with police and your name pops up in this database, the stakes become much higher in that encounter. But a lot of people don't know because they never are notified that they're in the database. Um, And a lot of people are in the database erroneously. So for example, in Chicago, there are examples of people who are in their 80s or who are babies who appear in this database. And so people want to know, am I in this database or not? And so they file open records requests to try to get this information, which is meaningful to them as individuals. And it's also meaningful to this broader public debate about whether gang databases work, whether we should be using them at all, or whether we should do away with them, whether they are what Babe Howell has called a sort of modern day stop and frisk, a digital stop and frisk. And so that is an example, I think, of how police transparency in the in the form of open records litigation can empower individuals and movement groups who are affected by investigative means without maybe knowing exactly how they're affected by them. And that I think is very different from the model of a news organization or a journalist coming in to get information and then use that information to sort of report objectively about what is happening with the gang database. When a journalist uses an open records law to obtain information, they're just trying to sort of get that information out to the public generally. 
But when a movement group or an individual or a civil rights organization uses it, they are using this information to advance a particular vision of what accountability ought to be and of the sort of normative consequences of what the police are doing. And that's something that news organizations have historically been very reluctant to do. And in your your piece, you have a bit of a mixed assessment of the efficacy of, of the second type of litigation. Talk talk a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, look, journalists depend on open records litigation, and they also hate it. And the reason they hate it is because it takes forever. And because sort of the ideal of FOIA or of open records laws was oh, I'll just file a request and then the government will give me what I want. And anybody who has filed an open records request immediately understands that that's not in fact true. You almost always need to be able to litigate or at least to persuasively threaten to litigate to get the information that you want. You have to go through a long and sort of convoluted administrative appeals process in most cases. And particularly when you're seeking information from law enforcement. A lot of law enforcement agencies are famously hostile to open records requests. So it's really a mixed bag in the sense that it's, in theory, a sort of entitlement to public information. And in practice, it's filled with friction. And in cases where we're expecting individuals to litigate, for example, a case regarding whether they appear in a gang database, I'm not sure that it's so reasonable to be asking people to take that on without like a lot of institutional backing. The reality here is that the result has been that organizations like, for example, the ACLU or defender organizations are taking on more of this work. And so it's not quite the sort of individual entitlement to information that it appears to be. Um, This has become a sort of impact litigation strategy that's spearheaded by organizations with the knowledge and experience to, to get what they are seeking, or at least to try very hard to get what they're seeking. So I think... That's part of the drawback. You know, on the plus side, it is nice. It's great that anybody can seek information about what police are doing. For so long, that kind of information has been held basically under lock and key and sort of doled out only under extreme circumstances. And so the ideal of distributing that power to understand uh, more broadly is, I think, a valuable ideal. It's just one that I think is not necessarily as readily achieved as it might appear. So with all that in mind, you talk a bit about alternative ways to achieve transparency, right? Alternative channels. What are those, right? And and what are the ones in the constellation of of everything out there? What do you see as the most promising? So I think the the biggest model right now coming out of sort of surveillance oversight movement, for lack of a better word, is to require more disclosure from law enforcement about what they're doing in terms of what kinds of technologies they're using and how they work before or at least while they're using them. So to affirmatively, proactively disclose information about investigative methodologies. You know, that's a model that we're seeing, for example, in New York City with the the Post Act, which requires NYPD to disclose what surveillance techniques and tools it's using. And it's also a model that we see coming up around the country with regard to Facial recognition, which requires, at least in a lot of circumstances, police to to notify the public that they're using face recognition. The drawback here is that, you know, a lot lot of the most sensitive technologies are not ones that law enforcement is going to be willing or happy to disclose. And we might be putting too much faith 
in the ideal of a proactive disclosure regime if in practice it doesn't work. It's a little bit untested and, and you can't know what you don't know to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, which is not something I do very often, but we do, you know, we're asking law enforcement to tell us what they're doing, but if we don't ultimately know what they're doing, then we can't know that the record that we're being given as a public is complete. The other thing that I think is, is a little bit more promising is as we see, you know, civilian oversight and other kinds of community oversight mechanisms become more of the public conversation about how to hold police accountable, we should be thinking about whether there's some way to promote accountability through those mechanisms. So I give the example in the paper of civilian oversight boards that have subpoena power and can therefore actually obtain information through an adversarial process from law enforcement about what it's doing. I'm a little bit of a cynic about how much law enforcement is going to be willing to tell us of their own accord. I think that probably came through. But empowering oversight institutions to do more, to get information, is promising to me. So, so those are two of the big sort of ways forward that I see. The last one is procurement reform. So in a lot of these cases where tech companies are sort of exerting pressure or control over transparency, there are ways that the procurement process could be tweaked to, to diminish that pressure or control. And one way is by making those procurement decisions more public, subject to public control, um, or subject to sort of city council control. In a lot of places, there is just no real oversight of the procurement process, as Catherine Crump has written about. And so because of that, I think if we inject sort of public principles into the procurement process, it can help to sort of diminish the degree of influence that these vendors have over transparency policy. And so just to close out, in, in the more immediate term, what are the things, what's the thing that you're most keeping your eye on, right, in, in the police transparency space? What's, what's something that you see as an actual, you know, plausible place of change that, that you're really watching out for, even if it's, if it's one of the things you just mentioned? I think procurement reform is going to, I mean, I, I might be hoping this more than believing it, but I think that procurement reform is going to happen. I think that we are in a space where there's both a, a deep sort of appetite to change the way that law enforcement is accountable to the public and at the same time, a deep mistrust of tech companies. And where we see those two sort of intersecting is when tech companies sell their products to law enforcement with no oversight. And so I would imagine that there's going to be some changes to state and local procurement processes to ensure that there's a more rigorous sort of form of public oversight when law enforcement agencies buy advanced technologies, uh, that they shouldn't only be sort of looking to the lowest bidder, for example, but that there might be other sort of public values that are important to consider, including transparency. And it's important to say, I, I don't think this is happening only for law enforcement. I think this is part of a broader conversation about accountability for the use of algorithms and AI in government writ large. And so one of the places that that is going to play out is in procurement reform. And that is all the time we have for today. Hannah, thank you so much. Thanks, Jacob. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Your audio engineer this week was Hansa Shatu of Go Rodeo. The podcast is edited and produced, as always, by Jen Patia Howell, and your music is performed by Sophia Yan. Please consider checking out the other podcasts in the Lawfare Podcast universe. We have Rational Security, Lawfare Noble, and Shatter, a new conversation podcast series featuring interviews done by David Priest and Shane Harris. If you like the Lawfare Podcast, 
you're going to want to check those out. Thanks as always for listening.